Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to read from a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 7 before we start, though. Father, bless your word. And as we continue on, Lord, in the hard things, may we continue to see your heart and your instruction. God bless these people. Anoint them, move in them, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. As he wrote that to a church, to Christians. And as many of you guys know, as you've been with us, as we've been walking through the letter to the Corinthians, that uh, Paul has now kind of punched them right square in the nose, if you will. Kind of put them back on their heels. Things that they were proud about that were going on in their church, he called them out on in a big, big way. He's going to continue to do that for the next few chapters. And in this chapter, and, and during some of this, God may call you and I out on some of the things we've got going on in our life. And it's not, again, not always easy. Paul is going to bring out, he's going to continue on in the vein of, of, the, of judging, making decisions, weighing things out, spiritual understanding in our life and in the life of others. How that affects our witness to the world and the sin that occurs in the church. As they continued, divisions would continue to rise among them. It became petty, and they began to drag one another into court. They became very sue-happy, if you will. So, I think that as we go forward in this, it's important to remember why, why you talk about sin. And I think it'll become evident by the end. Why, why the church can't step back and say, well... That's just, you know, I just, I just slipped. Well, that was, you know, that's a weak spot in my life. Or whatever way that we might define sin. We have to come back and we have to talk about it directly and call sin, sin. Because if we don't, if we just, if we're about what feels good, what makes me comfortable on Sunday or I smile for the rest of the day because I came to church, if we only stick to that and never call sin sin, what happens is grace becomes cheap. If we don't understand what actually occurred and the cost that is associated with that, what that action actually was, then grace becomes cheap. It was just simply a slip and God just kind of winked at it and we moved on. So you can as I'll bring this up a couple times over the course of this chapter, but grace has a price. Now, to the one who receives it, yes, it is free. We receive the grace of God absolutely free. If we could earn it, it wouldn't be grace. And so that why people have that acronym, Christ's riches, or sorry, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. The grace of God that you and I received, the grace of God that the Corinthians received, it was not free. It was free to them. It's free to me. It's free to you. But it was not free to the Lord Jesus Christ. It cost him everything. And so when we begin to step back and we don't call sin sin, when we step back and we say, well, you know, that wasn't the wrath of God poured out on his son, the, wrath, or the reason why the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the world because of these things, we begin to just cheapen that. We also cheapen grace. We cheapen justice. We begin to cheapen things. So as we, we step into these things, we continue into the hard things, um, we know that it is for a purpose that God doesn't sidestep real things. He's teaching us and training us and leading us to Him. In that... Oddly enough, when we get a good look at what we really are, Christ is magnified. His unconditional love for you is magnified. 
And as if we don't magnify that, the whole thing becomes cheapened. You know, Jesus began to teach, Jesus taught on this when he said, you know, those who are forgiven much, what? Love much. But if we don't understand, there's a direct correlation between understanding the love of God and what he cost. Because God so loved you that he gave that cost, that price. And when we begin to continue to understand what it is that we were saved from, who we are before, without Jesus, that love and that grace is magnified. Because we, we are a church, and I wanted to mention this last week as we were digging into hard things and dealing with sin in each other's life. We are a church that makes it a goal to rest firmly in the grace of God. Not to become legalistic, not to be, you know investigating and looking for every sin and every nook and cranny and trying to root it all out or, we, or none of us would make it. But we want to rest firmly in the grace of God. And I hope that, that if you could make it anywhere and love Jesus, and serve Him and live an abundant life, that it would be here. So we, we don't want to forget that we, tr we truly rest in the grace of God. But again, we can't step back from calling sin, sin, because we cheapen the whole thing if we do. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous, and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you know that we judge do you, do you not know that we will we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life if then you having judgments concerning things pertaining to this life do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge i say this to your shame is it so that there is not a wise man among you not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren. But a brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Bringing the family matters to court. <laughs> now, first I just want to just kind of qualify this with, you know, going, not going before courts. Is He's not talking about things in which God has instituted the government to take care of. For example, murder, rape, molestation, things like that. That's not to be handled just by getting a brother or swept under the rug or kept within the church. God has given the government to bring execution, to execute judgment on such matters. He, he's, he's talking about the petty things that would go on within the church. You know, Billy Bob borrowed my bike, was riding down the road, it came back, and it was, a, it, was a, it was just junk. And I tell you what, I think he owes me 500 bucks. And if he doesn't pay me, I'm taking him to court. Just, it's really just kind of dealing with that stuff. Airing out the dirty laundry in, in the court system. And he says, dare you. How, how can you be so bold to do that? To take it between the, before the least esteemed. That word is... Um, contemptible, despised. How can you do that? You're going to take it before those who have not experienced the grace of God. You're going to take it before those who aren't reading God's word and learning about God's justice, grace, mercy, retribution, and you're just going to go air out the dirty laundry to everybody in the world. Continuing on that witness. See, they had that witness in the last chapter that, that everybody in, in their community knew that they had sin going on that the world thought stunk. And now they're continuing to take every little petty thing. They were all kind of just so happy. And there's just something about the covetousness, the greed, the pride that goes along with all of that. As we see that coming about in our culture as well. There's an interesting little, uh, you can get lost in the sea of it all. But I was looking up uh, tort expenses. So tort is basically a, when, 
when you sue someone for this, it is uh, a wrongful act other than a breach of contract, so not a breach of contract, just a wrongful act for which, may, um, for which relief or some kind of compensation would come for damages or injunction. So in 2003, the American Tort Reform Association estimated that there were $243 billion in tort costs. That's what gets tied up in court, that's the cost of the lawyer, that's the things that get paid back. So, you know, a little over a decade and a half ago, it was two, almost two and a half billion dollars. Now, the U.S. Financial Education Foundation estimates that there are $589 billion in tort cases. <laughs> That's more than we spent on uh, defense under the Obama administration. <laughs> All of the military combined, we sp there was more money being spent on frivolous lawsuits. Not all of them. Some of them are probably just, and in our system, sometimes that's the only way that you can correct a business. But most of them had become, many of these have become just predatory lawsuits. That institution has money. We're going to find a way to take them to court and sue them. I'm going to win, I'm going to win the lawsuit lottery, and I'm going to get some money. I spilled some hot coffee in my lap, and I got a third-degree burn, millions of bucks. Over and over, there is a mountain of them. Did you know that they also went on to report that there were 40 million lawsuits? They're averaging 40 million lawsuits a year right now. <laughs> Over a million registered lawyers, they say. This was Corinth. This is America. This is part of the reason why we have such a health care debacle, among many other reasons. <laughs> you know, there, I remember I was listening to a pastor this week, and he was talking about how um, they were actually taking seminars, even how to, how to get in and, and to sue to get your rightful money out of these organizations, and they were also including churches in this. Any institution that they perceive to have money, you're going to come for. And so I guess we could praise the Lord for not having a lot of money here. We don't have any lawsuits. <laughs> I don't know. That was just a side thought, but... <laughs> but this was coming into the church that you wronged me, you owe me. And, if, and, and I'm not even going to give a chance to make this right. We're going to court. They'll probably give me more. <laughs> you know, it, Paul says, you know, don't, don't you know you're going to judge angels? And there's really actually not a ton in Scripture about that. Don't you know you're going to judge the world? You're going to be a part of this? You guys can't figure out the responsibility because you didn't return the, the jacket or the car on time. can't figure these things out. You really got to go tear each other apart in court. And you see these things, and you guys all know, I mean, it becomes such a common thing. Man, when, when families tear each other apart over a will, and drag each other in court, and the fight, and the infighting. And Paul purposely uses brother, brother, brother to, to bring in that family element here. What are you guys doing? He says. You know, when you when you see a family tear each other apart over grandma's teacups or whatever, you know, you look at that and you say, "Man, I hope I never do that." What are you guys doing? Why would you do that? I mean, go to court. When Paul's going to say, "Isn't it better to just..." Suffer loss, just take it, man. I'm not, I'm not going to fight over that. It's going to dishonor the one who owned it. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse 26. This is, this is some of what God has promised to his people when it talks about, don't you know these things? Now, Paul's going to say this about six times in this chapter. Do you not know? He says it a handful else other, in other spots in, in Corinthians. Do you not know? Do you not know? Do you not know? He only uses that phrase. That phrase is only used three times outside of Corinthians. He expected these guys. He had taught them. They knew better. Verse, beginning in verse 26 of chapter 2. And he who overcomes and keeps my works till the end, I will give him the power over nations, over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall dash to pieces be dashed to pieces 
like the potter's vessels. As I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. What a promise. And I love the little headline, if you have them in your Bible there, that this was written to a corrupt church. Turn to the very last church of these seven churches in chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. Very famous verse. Jesus giving another promise to a church that had become corrupt, lukewarm, thought it was special, but it was actually poor and naked. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also have overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. Wow. What a promise. What that's held out. And he says, man, that's where you're going to be. You're going to sit down. You're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. And you're upset about tube socks or whatever. <laughs> you know, whatever the court case was that they were dragging each other in. It wasn't, it wasn't something like, you know, armed robbery. That was for the government to handle. This was petty stuff that they were just dragging into small claims court. Judge Judy or whoever you want to put in there. And he said, what are you doing? You're going to drag the family matters, air out our dirty laundry as a witness to the unbelievers. And on top of that, he says, you're going to take it to people who don't know God. And he says, they're the least esteemed. The person who hates and does not believe in the living God, that's who, the one who, whose life is going to end, his destination is eternal judgment, the ones who are going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. I'm going to choose these guys to judge this matter. What are you doing? So, Paul's getting on on them about that. Don't take it before the unbelievers. And it's interesting to know, and it's my interpretation, but I'm going to throw it out there anyways. Note that, that he is directly speaking about the contrast between the believers judging and non-believers judging. It'll be important later in this chapter. Verse 7, now therefore it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do, you, why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. There is, as he continues on, Wouldn't it be better just to suffer wrong? They didn't like that. We Americans, we certainly don't like that. We can't even have, well, I guess I probably would have been a testimony of that yesterday. I don't even like being cut off. Retribution. (laughs) It's a good time for prayer driving. (laughs) But we don't like that. And instead of looking to the Lord, looking to His Word, looking to what He has done for us, They were dragging him before one of the most corrupt cultures and saying, hey, pick, you know, give me a judge or whatever out of that. And whatever they decide, that'll be good. Turn with me quickly to to Matthew chapter 5. You guys, many of you guys know the Sermon on the Mount, but Jesus, I'm not going to go too far down this road, but I just want to kind of read out some of his words in conjunction with what we're reading. Here with Paul. In Matthew 5, Jesus teaching, teaching not only his, his people, the disciples, but also many others. Beginning in verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. 
You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you, you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The Corinthians missed that. Those who were suing them or spitefully using them, they were going to take them before the ungodly people of the world and air out their dirty laundry. Paul said, man, this is already another failure. It doesn't matter if you win or not. It's already a failure. Wouldn't it be better to suffer loss? And that's contrary to our nature. It's contrary to our culture. I'll tell you what. (laughs) You'll find out quickly if you... Watch someone get spitefully used or abused. We'll find out real quickly in our culture what, what comes out. Paul is teaching them, you know, going off from some of the principle of what Jesus taught of, he said, even within your own family, man, this, this shouldn't be happening. We need to be separated, noticeably different, but instead... You're not. When families begin to tear each other apart. Verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, past tense but you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So this is, this is a verse that I wanted to take note for because he was contrasting going before the unbeliever, the least esteemed. Because, and I'll just throw myself under the bus a little bit, I do believe, personally, that I see in the Scriptures a case to be made for the ability for salvation to be rejected. I don't believe that it can be lost or stumbled or tripped or dumped out accidentally. But I don't believe this verse is one of those verses that teaches it. Many people will quote this verse if, if someone's in sin and say, don't you know that, that, you're, that you're lost? Even if they were, had made a confession of Christ. I don't believe that this verse is teaching that. I believe that this verse is expounding on the judges, the ungodly judges who do not know Christ of who they are taking their court cases to. If you follow the context of the chapter, he goes with, why aren't you taking it to the church? You're going to the unbeliever. Why are you taking it to this rather than that? And so he is reinforcing the idea that don't you know, don't be deceived, all of these guys, no matter how wisdom, how, how wise or how smart they are, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. They're not going to rule and reign with Christ. Don't take it to them. You were one of them. You know that they're not saved because you got saved. Don't be deceived. These guys are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. There'll be a lot of disagreement on that. But I believe in context, that is what he is clearing up, making a clear distinction between those who are saved and those who are not in the context of bringing your issues to them. So don't be deceived. God doesn't have grandkids, only children. There are no good enough people in heaven. There is no good enough people that will inherit the kingdom. Only those who are perfect in Christ Jesus by faith in him and repenting from their sin. So I take a little extra time on that because it is a verse that's quoted a lot and there are similar verses in other chapters or in other books that we'll deal with another day. But in context, I do not believe that he is saying, hey, if you're a Christian and you were doing some of these things last week, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. 
I don't believe that that's his intention by saying that. It's his intention to contrast those who they were seeking judgments from. Anyways, I don't want to beat that to death. You can read it and be accountable for the Lord for yourself on that. But again, he repeats on that, do you not know, do you not know? These are things that they should have known and were supposed to know. So these guys don't inherit the kingdom of God. Fornicators. Sex outside of marriage. I don't care if you call it good old red-blooded American or what you call it. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Nor idolaters. Elevating something beyond the Lord. Adulterers. Homosexuals nor sodomites. And there he's dealing with um, primarily uh, they were male prostitutes that would give themselves in those acts. And he's dealing with that because there were Christians who were indulging in that and their culture was full of it. All the way back in the earliest Greek culture, Plato was advancing that and saying how wonderful it was. They're in the overseen by Rome now and the first 14 out of 15 Roman emperors were either homosexual or bisexual. Their culture from the top down or whichever way you want to look at it, bottom up, it was corrupt. He said, make no mistake, these guys are not inheriting the kingdom of God. Those who steal, verse 10, those who desire something that they don't have, that they must have it. Drunkards, drinking till drunkenness. No revilers nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. It's tough words. He's calling it out, sin is sin. The wrath of God is poured out on the world because of it. But he points out in verse 11, but some were such, such were some of you. Now we know, we've been reading, that there was sin in this church of all variety. But he still says to them, such were some of you, past tense. Why are they different? Why are they no longer outside, but now inside, inheriting the kingdom of God? Because they were washed by the Spirit of God, Titus 3, 5. They were justified, sanctified. They were sanctified by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you go back to the beginning of this book, chapter 1, verse 2, sanctified in Christ Jesus by the Son. And justified. They had now become just as they had never sinned before the living God, before the Father. Romans 8, 33. Washed, sanctified, justified. That's what made them different. They were cleansed, brought out to a new purpose, and perfect before the Lord. Hallelujah. So are we. So what kind of judges, what kind of people are you looking for? Before we kind of move on to the next section. Time-wise, I don't know. Uh, Yeah, we better. We better. Better to read the verses. Exodus chapter 18. So what kind of people are we looking for? And this applies to those who you look for judges, those who you uh, vote for in politics, so on and so forth. There was a real interesting discussion on it. I encourage you to listen to it. A gentleman named Ben Shapiro had um, John MacArthur on his show here recently. And he was talking to him about you know, everything from politics to Jesus. Well worth a listen as he gets into um, some of the qualifications of, of who you want in authority over you. Who are you looking to judge your cases? Uh, it was an interesting little YouTube video you can find. It's about a half hour long. Anyways, Exodus chapter 18, beginning in verse 20. As Moses was receiving some instruction of, of who to set over and judge the people of Israel. First of all, He says, you know, you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. So get get them the word, get them the truth, get them what's right, what they need to know. Verse 21, moreover, you shall select from all of the able men such as fear God. Number one, qualification you're looking for and someone who's going to make an important decision in your life, a judge, etc. Do they fear God? When you vote for someone, when someone's a judge, when someone's making a decision in your life and you have the opportunity to affect that, 
Do they fear God? Number two, men of truth. Number two, men of truth. Do they love the truth? Do they abide by it? Do they hold that up as the standard? Number three, they hate covetousness. He said those type of people set them over as rulers. That's what kind of just some good guidelines to plug into your next voting cycle to, to if you have an issue and you're looking at these scriptures and say, hey, I've got something going on between me and a brother and a sister in the Lord or whatever, and I need somebody from the body to maybe help us walk through that, to, to, to walk this out, to be right or wrong, to walk through that process of Matthew 18 that we talked about last week. Do they fear God? Do they know the truth, His Word? And do they hate covetousness? Just some good things from the Scriptures. So I want to see when that failed, when that broke down. See, God established a, a, a system of judges over the nation of Israel, right? God wanted to rule His people directly through His people. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 8. We'll begin in verse 1. Just a few books to the right of that. 1 Samuel, chapter 8. So Samuel, being really kind of the last judge, amazing man of the Lord, not one of his words fell to the ground, feared and loved God with his whole life. Chapter 8, verse 1. So for many generations, God had been ruling his people through judges. Now it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Tobijah. Then they were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They didn't fear God. They turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. They, loved, they, they were covetous. They didn't love truth, and they didn't fear God. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old. <laughs> Always nice to say. And you and your sons do not walk. <clears throat> sorry, your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say. To you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You know, we oftentimes we blame the people of Israel for wanting a king. And that they went from God ruled to ruled by man, and they got all the blessings of corrupt kings. But we see a transition there. It's because they had judges, they went, they had judgments occurring in their life by people who didn't love truth, who were covetous and didn't fear God. And they said, man, this stinks. I'd rather have a person who just we can pick. These things are it's important. And Paul is lining this out in the church. So back in 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> so it's just some good stuff for, for practical things in life of people who you want speaking into it. So back in verse or in chapter 6, verse 12, we have kind of a transition. Paul's going to get to talking about their sexual life. Just to a little, some degree, he's going to talk about it for a while. And compromise in these other areas in our life generally go hand in hand with compromise in every area of our life. When we become that petty, that prideful, that covetous, you can bet everything else is there with it sooner or later. So he's going to deal with some of those things as well. Verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will, be brought, I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. But God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So he steps out and he throws out a couple statements. A couple of these statements, one, all things are lawful for me, and food for the stomach and stomach for foods, are a couple sayings that really developed out of Epicureanism. So what is that? It is an ancient school of philosophy founded in Athens by Epicurus. The school rejected determinism, 
basically that there was no free will, everything was pre-appointed, and you were just a robot through life. And they had advocated heterism, which is pleasure is the highest good. That was the school of thinking, and it was inside the Corinthian church, that the highest good in your life is that which brings you pleasure. But it was of a restrained kind, so it wasn't absolute, but it was very dominant. Mental pleasure was to be regarded as more highly than physical, and the ultimate pleasure was to be free from anxiety or mental pain, especially when it arises from the fear of death or the fear of gods. So that was their goal. So they had this saying that all things were lawful for me. I could basically do everything because the highest form of good is not to be stressed out by anything, so I can do everything. Wouldn't take long to apply that to our day. <laughs> that as long as it feels good, that is right. It was the ultimate thing. And that, obviously, my stomach was made. I get hungry, I eat, I'm satisfied. Everything's good and nourishes my body. Therefore, that's good. Stomach for the food, food for stomach. That's the way it's supposed to be. And that's the way they lived. If there's an itch, scratch it. That's what they thought. And they applied that from the stomach organ to the reproductive organs. It didn't matter. They all considered that if it was made and designed and had a craving, then it must be needed to be fulfilled whenever that came across. And therefore, since it's seeking my pleasure and my good, that's the highest priority. It's all lawful for me. That's the way it was, what it was made for. Paul's going to correct those thinking. And he said, first off, you, you know, all things are lawful for me. But here's your guiding thing. Not all things are helpful. Freedom only goes as far, its boundaries is love. Love for God and love for others. You are absolutely free in Jesus Christ. But freedom has its boundaries, and the boundaries is love. I will not be bound under the power of any. You're not free to jump back into bondage. That's just foolishness. I won't be under the power of anything. There are many things that are trying to, t- to take and to bind you and to put you back under bondage. Paul says, don't walk in those things. I'm free to do... I'm free. But I'm not going to be bound under the power of anything. So as he begins to put in the importance of living for the Lord. The Corinthian church has bought into this philosophy of living horizontally. The next meal, the next day, whatever. Paul wanted them to live vertically. Their eyes firm, fix, fixed firmly on the Lord Jesus Christ. Those things above. And we too get caught up quickly on living not vertically, but horizontally, day to day with what we can see and what keeps our flesh satisfied. But Paul's going to call him to a higher walk, a better walk with the Lord. And he says, you know, yeah, you may, you may say it's all lawful for you, but not everything's helpful. Not everything produces spiritual fruit. Yes, you may say that food for the stomach and stomach for the food, but God's going to destroy them both. It has a limited time. You're looking, you're looking horizontally, and you should understand that it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a nothing. And that's what you're going to determine your walk with the Lord by. That's what you're going to determine how you store up treasures in heaven. He says, no, God's going to destroy them both. They're all got an end. The body's not for sexual immorality, but it's for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Now that's awesome. That God created your body for Him. What an awesome honor the being that holds the universe in his hand made your body for him and also what's even more of a mind-blowing moment is is he for you that's amazing i mean us for the lord that's cool but him reciprocating that relationship just you go back to that david moment who who is man that you're mindful of him it's awesome and it's wonderful. Now, the Lord made your, your, your body that you currently have awesome. Made, he's made it great. Uh, Philip Yancey, I think it was, in Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, he, made a book, he wrote a book, and in that he points out that you know, if you took all the DNA of, out of all the cells in your body, it would fit you know, in, in just one little ice cube chunk in your little ice cube tray. It would all fit in that, you know, seven trillion or however many cells you have in your body. But he said if you touched it end to end, all took all that information and you put all the DNA end to end, 
it would go to the sun and back 300 times. One way travels about 93 million miles. That's, that's just what you got for this temporary few year tent that you're rolling in now. He said that he's going to raise, not only did he raise the Lord up, but he's going to raise you up and give you a new body. And I'll tell you, the thing you got now is a clunker compared to that. And it is amazing. The body that you're going to get is amazing. He said, don't measure it by this, this, this tent compared to the mansion. Don't, we can look at this and say, man, it's, it's awesome and we're blessed and the Lord's in us and things are good, but it's, it's nothing. He said, let the, let the reality of eternity, who the Lord is to you and who you are to the Lord, let that be what guides the principles of your life. Not, not your urges. Not your cute sayings that you're learning from the world, but the Lord. And he's going to really kind of dive into this deeply. And I'll tell you, before we, before we do, the, as the Lord is really going to be teaching him in the middle of this mess, his unconditional love for his people. And those of you who are married or have had a marriage that honors the Lord or, or the time of just a good marriage, how comforting it is that if something happened to you next week and you wound up in a wheelchair, that someone's going to love you. They're going to be there for you. That if you have a bad week next week and you're a complete jerk, that they love you. They're going to be there for you. If you wound up in a coma, they're going to love you and they're going to be there for you. Through sickness and in health. And all of that is, is a shadow. It's a picture. It's designed to tell you about something infinitely bigger. And that is the love of God for you personally. That what, no matter what you're in next week, that doesn't separate you from His love. If you are in a wheelchair, or this body goes kaput or whatever. That marriage is supposed to picture is just, is just a small image of God's love for you personally. He said, man, don't let that guide your life. You're for the Lord, the Lord for you. And he's going to raise you up by his power. Those are the things that are to affect your life. That kind of love is to affect your life, to guide your life, to motivate who you are and what you do. Not, not a love that's not much better than pursuing a good cheeseburger. I mean, we laugh, but there's not much difference. These are things to, to guide our life. Verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. So again... A little bit of this, you know, some of these are going to be some tough verses. You're going to find a lot of different thoughts on them. So I'm just going to give you mine. I believe this first statement he's dealing with um, the body of Christ. You're members of his body, his temple, etc. As becoming a Christian, you become part of the body of Christ. Corporately. He says, are you going to take that member and you're going to go sleep with a temple prostitute, male or female, didn't matter. Are you going to take that member and say, this is what Jesus is into? This is what Jesus is up to. See, we have that little phrase, what would Jesus do? You know, but the correct understanding in these next few verses is probably, what is Jesus doing? If you're his hands, you're his feet, you're a part of his body, you're his temple, what is Jesus doing? Oh, well, he's hooked up over there with Buddha and the gang. Literally. And he says, certainly not. I love the old King James. God forbid that the world should see, a, you know, you got the despicable wing over there. That's, that's part of the body of Christ now. It's all, it's all one. It's all good. He said, certainly not. God forbid. Verse 16, he's going to take it to a deeper level. So not just corporate body, but he's going to bring it down to a deeper level. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For two, the two, he says, shall become 
one flesh. See, it's not just stomach for the food or things that are lawful. This is something that goes deeper. It's not a momentary thing that comes and goes. He reaches all the way back to the very beginning of sex when God gave it as a precious gift to humankind. God's not a prude. He invented it. He wants you to enjoy it. But as in all things in this life, it is to be enjoyed His way. And He says, this is not how you do it. And you are doing it in such a way that it, it, God said, I have made you in such a way that it is not just physical contact, but that uh, Proverbs... Proverbs says it well. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32, it says, Whoever commits adultery of the woman lacks understanding. He, do, he who does so destroys his own soul. There is something about this gift that God has given that reaches beyond the physical, and it will touch the very depths of your being, and you will not be the same. There is no such thing as casual sex. It will affect you. It is not just a physical act regardless of how insignificant you may have considered it. God says, don't do that. There are things going on and you are are doing things that are deeper than you could possibly imagine. Sex outside of marriage is destructive. Inside is a gift. And it creates and is beautiful. Outside, it's like robbing a bank. And I don't say this from as a person who didn't commit this or do it. But outside is a rob- is like robbing a bank. You get something. But there's, a, but there's a cost to it. You will pay it. Sex inside of marriage is like a deposit that builds safety, security, and will bring many blessings in return. One weakens, one strengthens. So there's a reality to it. Don't do that. It's not just an act outside of the body, he's going to tell us. But it affects much more beyond that. See, they believed, in verse 15, the beginning of that, it's possible, and those who know the language say that it was possible, there was another one of those Epicurean sayings that, that basically everything was just outside the body, nothing was really inside. And Paul brings in this and says, look, this affects, this affects you. It changes you. You're not designed to do that outside of marriage. It was designed to make a new unit, a new family unit to bring something. And however passive or insignificant, it changes you. It's supposed to. It was designed to change you. It was designed to bring about and make something new. Now I want to make something clear before we move on. That physical act in itself is not marriage Marriage is much more than the sexual act, of course. We all know this, but worth pointing out anyways. So it is a sin against the whole person, you or the person that you're with. Verse 17, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality, every sin that a man does outside of the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that you that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Sin outside of the body. Again, it's just a tough saying. Could have been an Epicurean saying. Could be, he could be speaking of the fact that when it talks about you, not just in chapter 3, the corporate body being the temple, but you personally are the temple of the living God. Not the outer court, but the dwelling place of God. And he said that is holy. And it is your highest and holiest calling in life to magnify Jesus Christ with your body. To glorify Him. And you're going to take that and you're going to smear it in the mud. And I know I'm running a little bit long, but I think it's worth it. You know, when, when we went down to Reading a couple months ago and we were digging around just trying to find things that were, that were lost in the ashes, we, we found uh, this lady. She had lost her wedding, wedding ring and we found it in the middle of this burned out house. And what that meant to her couldn't be put into words. That which was lost and had so much value 
was found again. And if somebody would have came up and thrown that in the mud or tossed tossed it off as a common thing, I mean, who could even stomach the sight of that who wouldn't react to that? Because something was so holy, so valuable to that individual. You understand that that's what you are to the Lord. You know, someone could come into this church and they could kick and scream and cuss and you say, oh man, or do whatever action you want to dream up. Say, oh, that shouldn't be done, man. You shouldn't do that in a church. You know, this is just a box. This isn't holy. You are. What happens with you matters. What happens in you, what, what you do with that, it matters. Paul says, flee it. There may, be, there may be strength in numbers, but the strongest position is to flee, to move to safety from these things. You know, in marriage, we learn, and we'll learn in these next chapters, our body's not our own anymore. And that by vow, by physical intimacy and commitment, that happens. But he says, do you not know that you're not your own? You were bought with a price. Not by vow, not by commitment, or physically coming together, the blood of Jesus Christ paid for you. If one married person doesn't belong to themselves anymore, their body is not their own, how much more with the precious blood of Christ do you belong to the Lord? That's both accountability, but also that love and protection. So we want to fear and serve the Lord. So hard hard things. But if we don't look at it and say, man, that is really sin, drunkenness, sexual immorality, whatever you want to draw from this chapter, that is absolutely sin against a holy God. And it was so offensive and so wrong, the justice of God demanded His wrath. And it's going to be poured out on an ungodly world soon enough but he'd also poured it out upon his son for you and I to receive by faith. When he's dealing with these Christians, he said, man, you should have enough grace to suffer loss for your brother if need be rather than dragging him over court through these silly things. How much grace do you have? And again, grace who to receive it, that's free. To give it, that costs. It costs something. So if you took your sins and you stacked them up for this list or another list, and you know that no matter how high you could get, the grace of God is even bigger. You could take the sins of history. You want to line up Hitler, Stalin, Mao. You want to line up everything through history. Stack it all up. The grace of God is bigger. There is no depth too far nor sin too great, where the grace of God is not bigger yet. And he's calling them to that. Look at this. Don't live your life on the temporary and your erotic, sensual love for whatever pleases you. Live it by the love of God for you. Because you are not your own. You were bought with a price. And you've been washed, sanctified, made holy, he calls them to live vertically and not horizontally. So I just pray that as hard as it is for the Lord to have the Lord reveal sin in our life, know that one of the blessings is, is that we're reminded not just of what was, you know, we're not to live in that, but that God has paid the price. His grace, His love that's given to you freely and unconditionally by placing your faith and repenting your sins, trusting in Jesus Christ to save your life. Cost Him everything. As we come into Christmas, we're babies in mangers everywhere. Maybe take a minute this week and meditate on that. That the, the Lord of heaven and earth, again, who 
who holds the expanse of an almost unmeasurable universe in his hand, who possesses all riches, all life, all past, all present, all future. First Philippians chapter 2 said he, that Jesus Christ took that while never ceasing to be God, but everything that it was to reign and rule, to, to be God, he didn't value that as something to cling on to, but he set it aside and became a slave. Became just like you and I. The being who created you and spoke this universe into existence had to have his diaper changed. Why? Because the, because the unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. There needed to be a price to be paid, a way to redeem, to buy back. And the Lord of heaven and earth came and did that for you. His unconditional love. But it had a price. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that you don't wink, you don't wink at the stuff. That no matter what our culture does or where we go, Lord, you don't just write it off and excuse it and say, oh, well, you know, Jesus died on the cross, I'm going to live the way that I want. Lord, but you call your people to holiness because our highest calling is to magnify you in our body, in our life, that the world would clearly see you in our interactions with our brothers and sisters, in how we conduct ourselves. Lord, may purity in life, whatever form it is, may we be known for that, to be people who live and love like Jesus Christ. Lord, may those things guide us as we walk with you and someday we'll be standing in your presence by your grace, by your riches that came at Christ's expense, freely given to us, that we might live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.